D. James Kennedy Ministries presents Truths That Transform. America has just been through a deeply contentious election season. But once again, we remind ourselves that our hope is not in the government or the presidency, but in Almighty God. His living, active word, the Bible, fosters true Christian statesmanship. But how can we encourage that quality? Find out on today's Truths That Transform. This is Truths That Transform. Welcome to Truths That Transform, a viewer-supported program. I'm Frank Wright, president of D. James Kennedy Ministries. At the end of another election season, we are yet again reminded how deeply our nation needs Christian statesmen. Such leaders are few and far between. But that will have to change if we are to continue as a free people. The deep cultural tides that are wiping away the foundations of freedom in this nation will not shift easily, but the Word of God is powerful to change individuals and to change cultures. Later in this program, we will tell you how you can personally help make that happen in the corridors of political power, and you'll be encouraged by seeing true Christian statesmanship in action. But as we begin, we look back to the founding ideas of our nation. John Adams famously said, that our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other, he said. We have largely lost that foundation because it was simply forgotten, removed from our public schools, and replaced with politically correct progressivism. But Dr. Daniel Dreisbach, a professor at American University in Washington, D.C., is one of America's great scholars on the founding generation. And I recently had a chance to talk with him about the importance of scriptural foundations in the very structure of America. Your book, Reading the Bible with the Founding Fathers, speaks about the impact of scripture on the cultural institutions in the founding era, certainly in the lives and the thinking of those who gave us our form of government, but also it speaks to the profound religious commitment of many of the great leaders of that day, in their, and it appears in their writings overwhelmingly, yes? So we know that in the political literature of the American founding, the Bible is, is cited, quoted, alluded to more than any other literary work or any school of thought or certainly any other writer. Uh, and by far, by one estimate, maybe a third of all citations in the political literature of the American founding is to the Bible. So it has a profound influence on the literary work of the founding generation. This was a generation of Americans that read the Bible carefully. They read the Bible from cover to cover. We know that because in their writings, they make reference and allusion not only to famous biblical passages, but obscure biblical yes, passages. Yes. And that, that gives us a hint that they know yes. the Bible well. We find that the founding generation uh, looked to the Bible be, for reasons of uh, trying to follow a model of Republican government, right? There were Americans who believed that in the example of the Israelites having crossed over the Red Sea, adopt a Republican form of government, representative government. You might uh, find this in a text like Exodus 18.21, for example. They saw in the laws of Moses models for due process. Uh, some would have seen in uh, the Hebraic experience models of separation of powers, yes. the separation of powers between prophet, priest, and king, for example. So they, some of them would have looked to the Bible for these kinds of models that they would have thought worthy of emulation in their own political systems. Or at least they believed that this was evidence that God endorsed an idea like Republican government, even though their form of government may not have been modeled exactly on the model that we read about in uh, the Old Testament. You've referred to Washington's um, letter to the states as his first farewell address in which he was anticipating the resigning of his commission as commander-in-chief of the armies. 
in it, Washington makes a reference to the founder of our religion, making it pretty clear that when he says religion and morality are indispensable supports, by religion, he means Christianity. Yes? That certainly is the way I interpret and read it. Um, so when Washington uh, re, uh, writes his letter in June of 1783, uh, really setting the stage for leaving his position as commander in chief, he is giving his parting advice to the nation on what they must do, this fledgling nation, right? And in the last paragraph of this speech, which at the time he writes, he thinks this is the last time he's gonna be communicating to the American people. Where does he go? He goes to the prophet Micah, chapter six, verse eight. And he says, he says, if we ever hope to be a happy nation, he says, we're gonna to have to do justice, love mercy, straight from the text of the prophet Micah. And he says, we're going to have to learn to imitate that author of our religion, referencing Jesus Christ and the virtues. As citizens, we're going to have to learn to imitate those virtues of Jesus Christ if we're going to prosper and flourish as a nation. Many judges and government officials wrongly believe, and contrary to our founding, that religion has no place in public life. But in fact, the opposite is true. The positive influence of Christianity in public life cannot be overstated. Perhaps the greatest exemplar of this truth in recent centuries was the great British Christian statesman, William Wilberforce. As Dr. D. James Kennedy reminds us, Wilberforce's specifically Christian outlook and actions changed the world for the better in profound ways. William Wilberforce, not a name that is a household name in America, but of course he was British, born and lived his life in England. But other men who were British are perhaps better known, such as William Carey, who was the founder of the modern missionary movement, and uh, David Livingston, who was Scottish, a part of Great Britain, and so impacted and transformed the continent of Africa. William Wilberforce was a remarkable man. He uh, was a man that had a few outstanding gifts, and one of those was his ability to speak. But you say, he was a great man. Well, he was. He was a giant of a man. Well, he must have been very impressive, and that's why people would listen to him and why he could accomplish so much. Do you know, do you know how big he was? He was four foot 11, four foot 11, he was hunchbacked and his head was always down and turned slightly sideways. That was William Wilberforce who changed the world. One day when he was running for parliament, he couldn't see the people. The people couldn't see him. Somebody set him up on, on a table. And a reporter watching it said, they put a shrimp up on the table. But I listened to him. And as I watched and listened, he turned into a whale, a giant of a man. He had a face which was cherubic, beautiful eyes, and a most winsome voice, and a heart that was huge, a caring heart. But he wasn't always that way. He was blessed. His father left him a fortune. His uncle, his grandfather left him a fortune. His uncle left him another one. He was one of the most wealthy people in England. He hobnobbed in his younger years with all of the greats, he was an intimate friend of the prime minister uh, and with other 
earls and knights and whatever, and was very much at, desired in all kinds of social activities. He was not a Christian. Oh, he was a, an Anglican at the time, but religion meant nothing to him, really. He was very worldly, charming, witty, uh, friendly kind of young man. Then one day, his mother said that she would like to spend the summer on a tour of Europe. And Wilberforce invited one of his old school teachers when he was in school to go with him. And they read the Bible. And of course, they would read, as every halfway educated Englishman at the time could do, they would read the Greek New Testament. So they were going along reading the Bible. Now, this was the very word of God, and it pierced this young man's heart, and he was converted to Christ. When he came back, it caused a great shock. He went to see John Newton because there was something he was, that he was really concerned about, and that was slavery. And he thought Newton ought to know something about it since he had been a slave trader in his unconverted days. And he said, do not leave your position in Parliament. You would be deserting the calling that God has called you to. And so he decided to stay. And he decided also that he would find the greatest cause that he knew about, and he would give his life to that cause. And the cause he chose was the end of slavery in Great Britain. But there was hardly any part of English business that wasn't wrapped around slavery in some way or another. So what did he do? He decided he'd give a talk. He spent two years studying to give that talk. He finally stood up in Parliament and spoke, and he was by this time probably the greatest speaker in Parliament. He spoke for four and a half hours. He made his motion to end the slave trade in Great Britain. The motion was defeated, roundly defeated. Well, he did not give up. Came back the next year, gave another speech, another motion, defeated. Next year, defeated. The next year, defeated. He gave up the next year, came back the following year, and gave another speech, and another, 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 and another. Finally, the vote was positive, and the British slave trade ended. But that was only half of his goal. It was to end slavery in all of the British colonies. So he set himself to that. Again, 25 more years. Now he is an elderly man. There are still hundreds of thousands of slaves in British ownings. But he continued to pray and to work as he grew older and older, he continued to persist. Every year a speech, every year another vote, every year defeat. Finally, he was unable to continue for health reasons. He retired to his home in London, and in that session they had a great discussion of the subject. A vote, a motion was made to end slavery in all of the colonies of Great Britain around the world. The motion passed. There was a great outcry of joy among all of those that had worked with him for so long to end that, and they sent a runner to his home to, help, to tell him before he died that at last his great cause had been won, and the victory came. And of course, he rejoiced in the Lord that this had happened, and that a lifetime of effort had succeeded. May I point out to you this? Great Britain ended slavery without a civil war. And at Westminster Abbey, these are the words that are carved into the marble where he has been laid. In an age and country fertile with great and good men, 
he was among the foremost of those who fixed the character of their times, because to high and various talents, to warm benevolence and universal candor, he added the abiding eloquence of a Christian life. What difference does Christianity make? The eloquence of his Christian life was credited with changing England. Dr. Kennedy had a great passion for Christian statesmanship, and it's one that we share today. He rightly believed that the removal of a Christian influence from American politics would presage the doom of our nation. He also believed that Christians applying biblical truth through the gospel and the cultural mandate were our nation's only hope. The truth of these things is nothing short of self-evident in our day. In a few minutes, we will share with you how you can help restore a Christian influence in government. But right now, take a look at how that happened in one man's life, a man inspired by Dr. Kennedy and one who carries on his legacy on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. today. John Jay, Chief Justice of the First Supreme Court said that this is a Christian nation and it behooves Christians to prefer Christian rulers for this Christian nation. As an engineer in Southern Indiana, I spent virtually every workday afternoon listening to Dr. Kennedy, his radio ministry, Truths That Transform, on the radio as I drove home from the power plant every afternoon. And so at the feet of Dr. Kennedy, you might say, I was enlightened and encouraged uh, that the United States of America was, was divinely appointed to be a shining city on a hill. After learning from Dr. Kennedy on his radio ministry for years, Dr. Kennedy began a, a, a conference series, the Reclaiming America for Christ conference, and the first one uh, was in early 1994. And so uh, I had the opportunity to attend and sat through dozens of great workshops on various public policy issues. Uh, But in one of the uh, plenary sessions, when Dr. Kennedy brought all of the conference attendees together, he gave us a charge, you might say, and that charge at one point got very personal to me. Let me tell you this, my friend. You can't vote for Christian rulers if Christians don't run, how about you? Some of you ought to be in office. Well, you can imagine, at that time I was considering that very thing, and it so happened that after Dr. Kennedy, uh, you might say, confirmed uh, what the Lord was leading in my life, Um, A few weeks later, I announced a run for the first time uh, for the United States House of Representatives. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, end quote. Uh, there have, uh, it has been concluded that there are essentially two clauses to that portion of the First Amendment. It's vitally important that uh, those here on Capitol Hill, as we work day to day, take a breath and uh, realize that we are here for a much higher calling than possibly just to represent uh, our, the folks back home. We are uh, sent here uh, in order to uh, minister to all the people in America. Since he had been in the halls of Congress, he is in a unique position to be able to apply these principles and teach people. Here at the Center for Christian Statesmanship, we're wanting to teach things that George Washington understood. In his farewell address, Washington said, religion and morality are indispensable supports to our country, to our free institutions. Our desire is to reintroduce into the public discussion these Judeo-Christian values. 
I'm excited about taking the helm at the Center for Christian Statesmanship. You know, Dr. Kennedy was a driving force in uh, not only my education on political matters and matters important to our culture, but he also uh, encouraged us to run for Congress, those of us who held a Christian worldview as well as a concern for the United States. One of the missions of the Center for Christian Statesmanship is to raise up a model of Christian statesmanship. What does Christian statesmanship look like? Well, we are going to train individuals, whether they're current members of Congress, uh, members of their staff, in issues such as the United States Constitution, a biblical worldview of foreign policy, for example, a biblical worldview of economics. What does the rule of law really mean in a biblical context so that individuals can be trained in statesmanship and more importantly, Christian statesmanship? Washington, D.C. is where Christ's light must shine and it can only shine as the result of Christians being here, being that light of Christ. Our government has never been more in need of a biblical Christian influence. This past election cycle brought that truth home like never before. In 1995, Dr. Kennedy invited me to become the founding director of the organization you just saw, the D. James Kennedy Center for Christian Statesmanship. Their mission is close to my heart, and I am excited to share with you a vital new project for bringing truth to the corridors of power. Here's my very dear friend, Jennifer Kennedy Cassidy, to tell us how you can be part of that effort. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you, Frank. My father, Dr. D. James Kennedy, was passionate about bringing biblical truth to bear on every area of life. And he recognized that it was especially needed in government, since government is playing a larger and larger role in our daily lives. We have just elected a brand new Congress, which will be sworn in in just two months from now. They will make crucial decisions that will affect you, your children, and your grandchildren for years to come. Now, you have a chance to influence them in the most powerful way possible. We, along with Evangelism Explosion International, which operates the Center for Christian Statesmanship, want to personally give every member of the new Congress a copy of the new D. James Kennedy Topical Study Bible. But we need your help in order to do it. Featuring over 700 notes and articles from my dad, alongside the modern English version of the Bible, and bound in genuine leather, the D. James Kennedy Topical Study Bible is a powerful tool for study and instruction. My father was well known for fearlessly tackling the major issues of the day, applying God's Word to current events, and this Bible helps to do the same thing. I don't know of any study Bible that covers such a wide range of issues, from the Apostles' Creed to whether the Bible teaches socialism and everything in between. Think of this Bible being in the hands of every member of Congress. You can help make that happen by giving a generous donation to the work of this ministry. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339 or call toll-free 877-962-7677 or go online to djkm.org. We'll thank you for your donation by sending you the important book, Reclaiming the Lost Legacy, The Founders and the First Amendment. This newly published book details the illegitimate removal of God from government and how we can reclaim our American biblical heritage. It features chapters from Chief Justice Roy Moore of Alabama, Frank Wright, and my father, among others. And it's our gift to you as thanks for your generous donation to help us get the D. James Kennedy Topical Study Bible into the hands of every member of the new Congress. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339, or call toll-free 877-962-7677, or go online to djkm.org. If this recent election season has shown us anything, it is the reality that electing Christians to public office 
while important, is not enough. Those Christians we elect have to be mature, informed, and have a well-grounded biblical worldview. And for the most part, that has not been the case. Too often they have abandoned principle on vital issues, being blown about by the winds of political correctness. Without a firmly rooted understanding, they have often been swept away by the cultural tide. Our culture is in a grave moral and ethical decline. Yet poll after poll shows professing Christians feeding that decline by lowering their standards in vital areas such as God's design for sexuality and marriage, the proper role of government in life, and many others. Elections are majoritarian events. And the problem today is that the majority of people in our nation have only a wavering grasp of right and wrong, with their notions of good and evil rooted in personal preference rather than in truth. Dear friends, if we give up on our calling as people of the book, we become just another interest group engaged in the pursuit of power. The Bible clearly tells us not to put our trust in princes, but rather in God. We have come to a watershed moment in American history. Will we Christians stand upon the word of God, the whole word of God? Or will we unbiblically limit the scriptures to the realm of personal morality and ethics, abandoning the public square to the forces of a brutal and voracious secularism? There is a battle ahead, a battle for truth, for righteousness, and for the very soul of our country. Elections don't determine these things, and they don't change these things either. God's word determines truth, and the bold proclamation of his truth changes things. It is time for us as Christians to recommit ourselves to the Lord and to his truth, and to trust God for the results. The scriptures remind us of the sovereignty of God with these words. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. I'm Frank Wright. Thanks for joining us for Truths That Transform. We'll see you next time. Next week on Truths That Transform. Dear friend, we are in the midst of a war, a war of values, a war against God and his truth. And it's why we're now in Washington, D.C. I would argue that the need for this ministry in this hour is greater than it was when Dr. Kennedy looked at our our nation's capital and had this idea for creating a ministry to powerful people. The need today is far greater than it was then. That's next week. Today's program is available on DVD for your gift to this ministry of any amount. Please call, write, or log on to our website today. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.